Good evening and welcome to our second part of our uh, tree care seminar from Purdue University. I'd like to thank Purdue University Extension Forestry and Natural Resources, uh, the Indiana Arborist Association as well for help putting on these seminars. Um, we have a uh, uh, we had tree selection last week. We will have uh, tree installation uh, this evening. And then next week, we'll talk about tree pruning and other tree maintenance. So we'll get started. Um, as we move forward, um, my uh, partner and colleague, uh, Ashley Mullis, um, with the Indiana Arborist Association, will be kind of watch monitoring the chat board. If there's any questions or problems, uh, please get uh, speak with her in the chat box. And also towards the end, um, we'll be making some announcements and we'll be answering some questions. So we'll get right to it. <clears throat> My name is Lindsay Purcell, I'm the Urban Forestry Specialist at Purdue University. And I teach in the Forestry Natural Resources Department as well as work in extension. And part of my job is working with people and communities regarding their urban canopy. Now choosing and selecting a tree is a, should be a well-informed and planned decision. Um, obviously a well-selected tree placed in the proper um, location can last a lifetime and it's an investment not just in your home and your property but in your community as well so we talked about selection last week we'll just touch on that a little bit but one thing about planting uh, I learned or heard quite often in in uh, my career early part of my career was you don't dig a ten dollar hole for a hundred dollar tree so that's what we're going to focus on is trying to, to uh, disseminate the information about research and current best management practices for tree installation and some early care. So back to selection and site considerations. We talked a little bit about this last week, but one thing we want to make sure we talk about is soil characteristics and make sure that we understand what soil texture we have, because that will make a difference as far as um, water holding capacity, pH, and things like that, uh, making sure that the site is compatible with the tree. Certain trees do better in certain soil textures and types. Um, we also need to be sure that we understand the environmental conditions. We talked a little bit about hardiness. We talked a little bit about microclimates and, and those things which may influence the tree sustainability. Planting space is the big one. Uh, making sure that you have enough planting space to conform or so the tree can conform to that location. Um, oftentimes we see trees, in, especially in the landscape, trees and shrubs overplanted because they're small. We've not planned for future growth. So we want to make sure that we understand how big that tree is going to get so we can allow for plenty of room uh, for it to grow. Trees really just need three things. They need food, they need water, they need light and they need space. And those are the three basic needs. And as long as they have all three of those in, in adequate quantity and quality, then they'll be able to live a long sustainable life. Also look to see if there's any existing vegetation around the plant or the tree as it expands and grows. Will there be any conflicts? Need to plan for that. And being realistic with your maintenance inputs. We talked a little bit about that last week as well, as far as are you able to manage and maintain that tree, especially during those early years of establishment? The tree will go through about two, maybe three years of establishment will it, where it will need some supplemental watering and also perhaps some monitoring for pests. And so you have to be able to commit some time to that. So again, one of the things that trees are certainly a green asset, but we don't want them to become a brown liability and a problem as we continue to sustain that tree. Um, also, from a community forestry standpoint, some social influences. Some people don't like trees. Some people just have a real issue with trees around them or perhaps had a negative experience with trees. Um, so, in fact, I just got a call this weekend from my extension office. Um, there was a dispute as far as somebody planted their tree right on their borderline or right on their boundary next to their driveway. And they're worried about um, the tree cracking their driveway and their, and their sidewalk and so forth. So it's be a good neighbor if you're planting in and around your, your neighborhood properties uh, to make sure that everybody's on board with, with planting that tree. Utilities, and I gotta say it again, obviously we see a lot of problems with utilities, unfortunate accidents and also uh, a lot of um, 
discord between utility companies and tree owners. And so, you know, like I said, utility foresters are some of the biggest tree huggers that I know. And obviously they have a job for service and reliability. So it's important that we make that call. It's so much easier than it used to be where you had to call each individual utility in order to make sure that you're planting a tree in the proper location. But now we call 811 within 48 hours, you can have your answer. So, and a lot of times we think we know where those utilities are, but oftentimes we forget or don't know. And as you can see, the lawn on the left or upper left there, that's a nightmare. And there's no way you can plant a tree there, even though you want to. I'm not even sure how they got that basketball goal in there, but perhaps that came first. But anyway, uh, contact your utilities. Also make sure there's no city ordinances if you're planting in that lawn space. Uh, for example, um, for the city of Indianapolis, they have an ordinance where if you're planting in that easement or right of way, um, that you do need to fill out or complete a, a request for that. And it's mainly just to make sure that you are planting the right tree and perhaps there's no future types of construction that could damage that tree. So, and there are often trained arborists that can help you with the selection and planting process. So it's good to get involved with, if, especially if it's a city right of way. Um, and of course, with utilities, it can be a very expensive mistake. Um, I've ha had uh, lots of uh, uh, experience with that with the local utilities and if you cut a fiber optic cable it can cost many tens of thousand dollars to repair if you didn't call 811 so so be very careful with that whenever you're you're digging underground so back to uh, tree selection if you want more information or you missed that a lot of what i discussed was in um, this uh, tree bulletin or publication um, FNR 531 available on the education store for free download. Also, there's a video that goes along with it. Um, if you want to take a look at that as well, as far as choosing a tree and some of the things uh, that go along as far as the considerations in that process. So really what it comes down to, to borrow the phrase from Stephen Covey, the famous author, is begin with the end in mind when it comes to selection and installation. Right tree, right place, spatial realism, make sure you got enough room, interpolate how big that tree is going to get in 25 to 50 years. Consider what type of environmental um, issues you have and also uh, pest management. And the whole idea is really to minimize the inputs for that tree and maximize the benefits. If we're constantly watering, constantly spraying, then certainly that's not good for the environment nor the tree owner. So getting the right information and doing, choosing the right tree and planting it right tree, right place is certainly important for that long-term sustainable planting. So nursery stock, big decision. Oh, there's lots of um, opportunities available for purchase, especially for the commercial guys. Um, as you can see up in the upper left corner, there's the root bags. Uh, the majority of our trees are purchased either bald and burlap or containerized. Um, there's also bare root available, um, also root trapper bags, air pots. There's all types of different uh, containers and planting mediums available. Um, but by and large, the majority are going to be found in the bald and burlap, which are field dug. And I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that, as well as the container plants. Those are the majority of, of, of what you will find in most of your nurseries and uh, garden centers. So plant selection at the nursery. Uh, make sure you look at the branch infrastructure. Make sure it's got a good so, a solid central leader system. Inspect the medium, especially um, and the root system, especially on containers. Oftentimes, especially on shrubs, you can kind of pull the, can, the plant out of the container and take a look at the look at the roots, make sure they're, they're healthy um, and not brown or, or dying or stressed. You know, a lot of times we buy uh, trees at um, some of the um, discount stores or big box stores and, you know, they've been sitting on the pavement, perhaps never been watered. And so um, they're probably stressed to begin with and you might be starting uh, kind of behind the eight ball to begin with um, when it comes to planting. So again, it's just like anything else, you get what you pay for. And so going to a reputable nursery or garden center um, certainly helps that sustainability process. So if you're not sure about what, how bald and burlap works, I thought it'd be interesting to show how this process goes in the field. So this is a big clump service berry, and you can see that they take this large mechanical spade and they push it into the ground and basically just cut the roots to the point that is more manageable uh, for the consumer. 
and it's been proven through research and observation that up anywhere from 80 to 95 percent of the root system is actually left behind in the field so there's not much there for them to grow with <clears throat> so what they do is they take this out of the field it's been growing in the field perhaps seven to twelve years then they put it in the wire basket uh, filled with a biodegradable burlap and as a result we get uh, this this is our this is our final product now remember uh, if you remember biology from basic tree biology or plant biology or perhaps other um, seminars or training that trees roots go to the drip line so the drip line of the tree is exactly where the canopy ends on both sides and all the way around so trees can form roots not just to the drip line but even past that and typically they only run about 12 to 18 inches deep so if we look at that tree from a plan view and we take a bald and burlap um, tree then we're looking at taking a, a very little of that root system so that's all we have to work with the very few roots and that's why it's so critically important to make sure that we dig the proper planting pit select the right tree and prepare it for its new home so this is our finished product this is what that bald and burlap tree looks like and if we were to remove all of the soil from it this is exactly what those tree roots would appear to be now this is on a two and a half inch caliper maple tree and the canopy was about 12 feet wide and the the root system on this was approximately three feet or a little bit less um, so you can see there's not much left there for it to work with and it's amazing that that tree can establish itself with that few roots but trees are certainly amazing survivors and uh, have amazing strategies in order to survive that transplanting process now container grown plants have their own advantages but some very distinct disadvantages uh, container grown plants are available pretty much for year-round planting as opposed to uh, bald and burlap materials where typically they dig in the spring and some in the fall and they, they only dig enough to, based on previous supply and demand and so there may be some opportunities where or situations where you want a certain tree but they might be out uh, the advantage for bald and burlap is often you get a bigger tree uh, because they're able to grow longer in the nursery um, with container grown plants the tree basically starts out as a seedling in a container and grows its whole life in that single container or it may be propagated into larger containers as the tree grows and expands uh, they're lightweight very easy to handle a bald and burlap tree that's three inches um, in, in caliper or diameter around um, can weigh up to 400 pounds uh, whereas a container grown tree that's two inches may weigh only 50 pounds so it's very lightweight and easy to handle but it does come with some distinct disadvantages just like the bald and burlap trees so oftentimes because they've grown their whole life in these smooth walled circular containers we get what we call root bound issues in the pot and they form what we call SGRs, or that's our acronym, acronym for everything. But those are stem girdling roots. And those can have a long-term effect on that tree's ab uh, ability to survive. Um, also, if, there's, if they're in the nursery or the garden center uh, for very long, <clears throat> because they're black, they absorb heat. If they're out in the sun exposed and it just kind of cooks those, uh, those roots. I've taken some soil temperatures in some of these containers at some of these uh, big box stores and the root temperatures were well over 100 and it takes only about 85 degrees to start calling, causing root degeneration. So you can have some root growth and health issues in container plants um, as a result of, uh, of, of what you buy. And this is basically what it looks like when you, can, when you take the container off. So this is one that's been held for a long time. This was a service berry that I used for a uh, little research project but you can see this smooth wall containers obviously roots are sp supposed to grow out or laterally um, but as a result of being in this circular container they start uh, creating these circular roots with which lies our problem so container plants this is one that uh, was planted in Lafayette uh, about four years ago and you can see what happens with stem girdling roots it basically just keeps the shape of the container because um, if for lack of a better scientific term, it's it genetically encoded that I'm supposed to grow this way in a circle. Uh, we're actually, what we wanted to do is go out into its new environment and expand its root system so it has more resources and stability available to it. 
Now, this tree um, or one very similar to it in that same location um, died, and this is what the root system looked like. So you can see very clearly the outline of that container with very few roots actually escaping that circular growth pattern. So this is what we call, this, call stem girdling roots. And it's a potential for tree death or failure. And sometimes very quickly, um, I've seen these tr container grown trees that weren't treated properly at planting die within a year or two. And I've seen them last 10 to 12 or 15 years. So again, it just depends on the species and the severity of that girdling. But there's a way to stop that, and we'll talk uh, in much more detail about that here shortly. So we've talked about selection. We've talked about the types of, of planting medium available to you. Now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit about planting and doing it the right way. So we're going to think about planting pit size. You know, we've been planting trees for, gosh, over 2,000 years has been documented. But, and you would think we would have it right. Uh, but current research and practices change. We learn about trees and their strategies for growth and how to create a better sustainable planting, thank goodness, um, because we want trees lasting a very long time. And the harsh climates that urban, uh, the urban conditions provide for that tree, well, we got to no know more about it. So we're going to talk about planting pit size. Width first. Now, width is dependent basically upon the amount of soil and space that you have available to you. Um, I've done a extensive, extensive literature review on recommendations for tree planting and oftentimes you'll see two to three times the, the, the size of the ball. Well, if you look at that planting ball, that's roughly 24 inches across. Now, if you're going to be an overachiever, let's say, and you're going to go three times the size of that planting ball so that you've got a good home for that plant, that means you're going to have a six foot hole for that tree. Now, two things come to mind, well, three actually. One, you may not have the space for that. And number two, that's a lot of work. And number three, it's totally unnecessary. Current research has indicated that planting width really has no significant difference in shoot ratio or, or caliper expansion. So really, the larger hole doesn't make any difference. Now, if you have serious compacted soils in some urban conditions or um, suburban conditions, a larger planting hole can compensate for compaction, but we want to use what's called more of a shallow wide configuration, which is uh, get, again special circumstances that's talked about in the publication if you want more information. So when it comes down to it, width really doesn't matter that much. Um, it needs to be at least one times as wide as if you have the space. But again, if you, this was a tree planting in uh, uh, suburban Chicago, and you can see we barely had enough room to plant that tree. And again, that's all that we had available to us. So you know, dig as, as much as you can get there um, within reason, and you should be fine as far as that tree's ability to establish in its new home. Now, planting depth is where we've had the most research and um, greatest revelations in why our trees aren't living longer and why they're failing. So when we look at planting depth, we want to look at the, what we call the root flare. And this is that area that's kind of flared out right before the stem turns into the root, superized root material. This is where our established grade should be. Planting depth is probably the most critical issue that we need to be concerned with as far as how deep to dig that hole. I see numerous images and emails and calls regarding tree, tree failure, tree decline, and oftentimes it's because the tree was planted too deep and it causes a, a myriad of biological and physiological problems as a result of that. So especially on bald and burlap materials, oftentimes trees are established in deeper than they need to be um, because of their very small root system. So the nursery may plant them a little deeper and higher up on the stem so they'll stand vertically straight. Well, over the years, as that tree gets bigger, that gets worse and causes additional problems. As you can see here with my students, um, we're trying to find the root flare on this bald and burlap. And it can be very deep and it can be very problematic if we don't establish the proper grade for that tree and plant it at the depth that it was in the nursery. Now, as many as 20, just as few as 20 years ago, that was still the best management practice. 
was to plant your bald and burlap tree at the same grade it was in the nursery. After all, it's been growing like that for anywhere from seven to 12 or 15 years, so why stop now? But there are some problems we found with that, um, with some very fine research from our colleagues in Minnesota and Florida. So this is what it should look like after you get done excavating. Um, after you've got found the root flare, you can see as similar to the diagram or the graphic on the right, you should see sort of a flare shape um, that comes that will actually give rise to what we call the main order root level. That should be your finished grade or the top of the planting pit, even with the top of the planting ball. When it comes to bald and burlap materials, I just assume it's too deep in installation. So I figure it's going to be, there's, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I have not had to excavate the root ball. So we just, before you even bury it, the first thing you do is just start excavating around that plant. I've seen trees as deep as 10 inches, um, too deep in the planting ball. Um, in fact, um, what we will do is remove that, excavate that, and get the proper finish grade. And you can see in this area, Here, where you have a little flare here. Now, oftentimes this is confused with the root flare, but actually it's the, a grafting knot. Uh, the majority of our trees are actually grafted. The only ones that aren't practically are oak trees, which are grown from seed, but especially our maples, which is very popular. But oftentimes um, the rootstock is a different tree and then the scion is grafted and often you get a swelling in that location. And that's confusing sometimes because people say, well, there's the root flare, when actually some nurseries will actually bury that knot because they feel like it's unacceptable aesthetically. And when people start excavating the top of the ball, they stop there, when actually you may have several inches to go. Uh, this is uh, me and my students planting some trees in the Purdue campus. So just to kind of recap what we did there. Um, so basically remove, obviously, the materials there, the, bol the burlapping materials. Um, and here's one of my students excavating the top of the ball. You can see they're trying to find that root flare. And this is what the finished product was. So you can see um, her finger at the top. Um, that is where the soil was. And you can see just below here, this is the grafting knot. This is where they thought it was supposed to be. But actually, we didn't find the main order roots and the root flare till clear down to here. So that was about 10 inches of excessive planting depth. Had we planted that tree without the treatment to the ball, that tree would have surely died. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how quickly that tree will succumb to that type of excessive planting depth. So this is what the, the final should look like. You can see the root flare down in this area. And then of course the, uh, the root knot at top or the grafting knot at the top there. So. Great identifiers there if you're planting this type of tree. Can't tell you the number of times I still see this happening, but we, we've also been taught to be very cautious and careful with that root system. So we wanna make sure that we uh, don't do too much. So again, handle the ball carefully, not by the trunk, but with the ball. We wanna keep that root um, interface, um, and can not let the tree get loosened up from the few roots that it has in that little bit of soil. Of course, cut and remove any twine. Um, lots of research has gone into these two items here. Um, you ask a lot of people and they'll have uh, quite a few disputes and, dis and disparity with this, but current research and best management practice practices indicate that we should cut and remove the upper one half to one third of the burlap and the wire material. And then you finish at the proper depth. So that's Again, there's a, a lot of ways you can plant a tree. I go by the science and current research, and this is certainly it. So there you can see on the trailer, this is all the twine and burlap and extra wire from the basket um, that comes along with it. And also the wrapping, this may look like a good idea to leave the trunk guard on there, but really it's not because it can harbor insects and cause disease issues. It's really just there to protect from damaging the cambium layer on the trunk. Uh, during transport and handling. So make sure you remove that as well. This is a good example of excessive planting depth. This was a maple that gave up in one of the parks in Indianapolis after about two years. Um, just 
all of a sudden died. And so I got to looking at it a little bit closer and you can see that there isn't certainly a root flare there. It looks like a pretty much a pole or pipe just going into the ground. So I did a little excavation, digging around and found that uh, this is my soil knife. And you can see that the soil knife is eight inches long. So it was a little, including mulch, 10 to 12 inches too deep, which obviously was a, a, a major cause for, for decline and death there. So it happens sometimes very quickly, but sometimes it may, a tree may survive several years. It just depends on soil conditions and maintenance that goes along with it. So even as little as three, four, six inches uh, too deep, Tree might as well be six feet under because it's going to die sooner or later. All right, let's talk about the installation processes for each one. Both bald and burlap and container ice plant materials have specific protocols for good planting techniques, and we're going to take a look at those. <laughs> Root dysfunction. As I mentioned, because of the smooth wall containers, they all have this circling or girdling roots that grow in the shape of the container. So our, our whole goal with planting a containerized plant is to interfere or interrupt that growing pattern. And basically all it comes down to is pruning. So here I'm taking, uh, this is that service spray we looked at earlier. Um, I'm taking a, a little pin device there. I'm actually checking to see where the roots are. Sometimes if you've, a containerized tree has been held for a long time, um, often they'll put additional soil on it. So I didn't really see a good trunk flare there, even on a container plant. Um, so I was just probing around to make sure that I could find um, the root flare there. So um, there was a little bit extra on it. So as a result, I did do some excavation. Um, remove the plastic pot. I know that may sound silly, but um, I have uh, seen this on several occasions. Also, uh, the most recent are um, some nurseries, especially in Michigan, will sell um, evergreen trees and paper mache pots. Remove those as well. Those are treated with a, with a chemical to prevent them from decomposing rapidly. And so as a result, the tree stays in that container for an excessively long time and basically just burn up from lack of water because it can't, the roots can't get outside of that container. Um, so make sure you remove any type of, of uh, uh, handling and transport material. So we take a closer look at our, our roots and obviously they're growing in a circle. And so again, they will continue to grow in this fashion until we interfere with that or intercept that situation. Now, in some of the older literature and extension publications, um, they would say take a box cutter and or a knife and just score the outside of the of the roots um, or take um, a hook or something and tease the roots out pull them out. Um, the, some very important research from our friends at Morton Arboretum in Chicago and down to the University of Florida found that that had absolutely no significant difference on intercepting that girdling root um, pattern. So it wasn't enough of an interruption to cease that circular growth and we continued to get stem girdling roots. So that doesn't work. So what we, what we determined we needed to do was be a little more aggressive. So I'm going back to checking the root depth and I found that there was about two inches of, of soil that was on there that I didn't feel comfortable with. So I started cutting that back and now you can see where I've revealed the main order root system. Now you can see this is a very, very important root. This is going to be one of those stabilizing anchor roots, but look where it's going. So as soon as that root hit the uh, container, it died down and then it started girdling, started curling it around. And so that's one of those we want to definitely prune and treat so that it grows out into its new environment as quickly as possible. So what we do, and here's a, another close up, and you can see where it's starting to dive down in. A lot of other larger roots are starting to just keep circling. So we've got to interfere with that. So what we do is we either, we either box or slice the root system. Now this is primarily on trees. Shrubs, most of the time shrubs aren't in their containers long enough to even form a decent root system. So unless it's been held for a very long time or you're buying large containers, it's an older tree, 
then I wouldn't mess with that root system too much. But trees especially, they've been in those containers for a very long time and they do establish those stem girdling root uh, formations. So this was what we call boxing or slicing. This is where you take a, a saw, a pruning saw or any type of saw, preferably one that you won't use for anything else because as we, as we have learned, uh, saws and soil don't get along too well and they can dull them very quickly. So I have one saw that I use just for tree planting for con uh, containerized plants. And what I do is I saw off basically just about a one inch piece in four cardinal locations around the tree. So you can see I'm just kind of cutting just that outer part there. So actually what I'm doing is pruning the root system. We know if we prune or trim um, shrubs and trees, we get a proliferation of growth in that location where there's meristematic tissues. Roots re respond much the same way. So if we prune those roots, they'll start spitting out new roots, so to speak, and they haven't been growing in that, in that girdling, circling fashion. So as a result, they establish in their lateral sense in a much quicker and more effective way. So you can see I just took off about an inch there. You don't have to get too deep into it. All you want to do is just get rid of that outer mat or those circling formations that uh, have, been, have been in that um, growth pattern for so long. As on occasion, I'll inspect the bottom of the plant. Um, and sometimes when, it's, when the stems dive down, well, they'll hit the bottom of the container and then they'll grow back up into the root system. And so sometimes I will cut off an inch off the bottom to get rid of that uh, diving or kinking root um, at the bottom of the container. So we've caught, basically cut on all four sides of the tree uh, to try to disturb or interrupt that system. And this is basically what you end up with. I know it looks like we've just uh, tormented and, and damaged the plant to um, within an inch of its life. But remember that important root? So I took a pruners and just basically pruned that. Now it looks like it would have damaged it, but what will happen is uh, this root will actually create some additional roots as a result of that pruning and hopefully establish in its home uh, in a much uh, more stable and sustainable way. Now this one was planted about four years ago, so I'm gonna actually dig this up and see how it compared. But we do have some statistics and some research that shows that uh, it, does, uh, it does work. So this was uh, some photos from a friend of mine, uh, colleague Jerome Delbridge, um, when we were working at Keep Indianapolis Beautiful. Um, this was a containerized plant um, that had been root pruned by boxing or slicing. You can see the outline of that container a little bit here, um, but by and large, for the most part, the, can, the roots are growing laterally and out into its new home as it should be. And this is a picture of one that wasn't treated. And you can see the outline of the container very clearly. And there's not very many roots that's actually growing laterally into the soil. So it does work, it does make a difference, and research has proven um, um, that it does make a difference as far as containerized plants. So don't be afraid to be aggressive with that root system and start treating those containers because it will make a difference. Um, if you've already planted a tree that's containerized, that's a common question, is it too late? What can I do? Well, actually it depends on how long it's been in the ground. If it's just recently planted, then I would suggest maybe excavating it and replanting it um, when conditions are, are best. Um, but if it's been in the ground for several years, then it may need the excavation and some stem girdling root uh, treatment by a professional arborist, but that's very situational and uh, often requires a certified arborist to take a look at that a little more clearly. All right, going to the backfill. Now we've got the hole dug, proper width, proper depth. We've treated the root ball with either as either the container plant or the bald and burlap plant. What do we put back in? A lot of discussion, a lot of contention that goes in behind that simple question. Well, the best question is just put back what you took out. So use the native soil whenever possible. Only under extreme urban conditions may we want to um, um, amend that or change what we put back in. But for most situations, especially in the landscape, um, it's best just to put um, the native soil back into the into that planting pit. Um, don't use sand, don't use peat, compost, humus, 
no fertilizers. We found that it's actually detrimental in many cases and fertilizing especially uh, no significant difference at planting time as far as establishment. In fact, it can be detrimental to the point uh, where some of those fertilizers are salts that can burn the new roots. So the best thing to do is just put back what you dug out. Uh, also, there's been some experimentation with wetting agents and gels. Again, no significant difference. Amendments are not recommended at planting time, except under very uh, specific circumstances by trained um, arborists and horticulturalist. Now, modifications are good, and they may sound like semantics or the same thing, but just the simple act of digging the hole and putting the soil back is a modification of the soil. That, that helps with compaction, it helps with aeration, it actually lightens the soil and creates a better growing environment. So just put, just a simple fact of breaking it up and putting it back in can have a, a major advantage to the, the establishment time for that tree. But stay away from the fertilizers and the other things that people often put on there. Again, unless um, um, you're trained in that kind of situation. There's been some uh, biostimulants that there's been a lot of research on that are used in urban conditions. Uh, but again, uh, make sure you know what you're doing and, and consult a professional or uh, your extension folks uh, for latest information on that. Okay, then the final touches, um, always get asked about pruning, but especially, we'll talk about that, but you can see where this, where the bald and burlap tree didn't have the twine removed. I see this still way too often. What it does is basically strangle a tree and it either, if it doesn't break off, it will die very quickly as that tree grows into that twine. The twine's made out of uh, plastic and it doesn't degrade. So it just basically stays intact, the same size of the tree and it basically just again strangles it. Also, this is a situation where they left the, the trunk guard on and they didn't take it off. They thought it would actually protect it, but you can see what happens. It's swelling on both sides of it um, as a result of that strangulation. That uh, plastic string that held that guard on there just basically kept it at the water and food from moving through the vessels in the tree. As a result, the upper part of the tree suffered and and died. So remove any tags, strings, or anything like that. All right, as far as post-planting care, we've got our tree in the ground, now what do we do with it? So these are all very important concepts that we need to think about uh, moving forward when it comes to making sure a tree gets off to a good start and on its own. So let's talk about mulching. I've been a lot of talk about whether we need it, how much do we need, and, and, and is it necessary? It does reduce evaporation, improves moisture retention, also helps moderate soil temperatures from extremes, um, and it does Im improve um, root development as well. Um, Dr. Burt Craig at Michigan State University has done uh, extensive research on this and has shown that it works very well and um, mulch is certainly necessary in the right amounts and applied in the right way. Um, one of the biggest things that I think that it helps do is it protects from mechanical damage and from guys like these on zero turning radius mowers going 47 miles an hour through the lawn and bouncing off of these trees like a pinball machine. Every time, or a string trimmer, every time they nick that tree and injure the cambium layer, that is a potential defect and decay and opportunity for that tree to fail. So again, it's a visual cue, if nothing else, that says, hey, I don't need to mow here, so it's mulch. So we'll just, we'll just mow right, stay away from it. So again, that's a, one of the biggest things is that visual cue to keep the, uh, the uh, lawn equipment aw away from the tree. Two to three inches is really all that it needs. Refresh some each year if needed. It doesn't hurt to get out there with uh, what I call, you know, a pitchfork and fluff it up because once it mats down, it can become hydrophobic sometimes and water will actually run off. Uh, but maintain those proper levels. There may, there may be times when you have to remove mulch. Um, oftentimes we get, oops. There's oftentimes that we will get these mulch volcanoes, and this is very minor in comparison to some, 
Um, but what happens is we get uh, an artificial growing environment here and a lot of adventitious roots growing because there's in the springtime or fall, there's favorable conditions, they're moist, and it's easier for the roots to grow in there. But in the summer it can cause major problems and other problems as well with decay and harboring pest issues. So here's just a few examples of some of the uh, extreme conditions of mulch. Um, this was in a parking lot in the Fishers, Indiana. Um, had a whole row of about 20 trees uh, mulched like this. This is what I call mulch Everest. This was a friend of mine sent this from up in Wisconsin um, from a big box store. Um, so they were uh, making sure to uh, protect that well from the uh, northern, northern winter weather. Then of course, uh, this was in a community planting um, here in Indiana and properly planted, properly supported, um, but they got a little over exuberant with the mulch and mulched it about 12 inches. And the reason behind that was I found out was the fact that not only did they bury the trunk too deep as you can see up in here, but what happens was the soil was so hard that they couldn't get their augers or their, their shovels down. So they had to raise uh, the planting ball and, and the root system and they replaced that soil with mulch. Not a good idea. If you can't get the proper depth for that tree, then you probably shouldn't plant it there. And I like usually tell my daughter, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this certainly is one of those situations where it was not good or uh, receptive for a long-term tree planting. Uh, concrete is not good mulch situation, even for uh, shrubs. Um, it will hold down the weeds, but uh, certainly not good for long-term growth there. But anyway, just a little humor there. There is, uh, there are, again, uh, additional information there regarding tree planting. There's a publication from the education store and then also an accompanying video that goes along with that that kind of helps explain. Um, so you're welcome to check those out uh, at, at your leisure. So just uh, kind of finishing up on some of those um, 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 early establishment um, maintenance situations. Do I need a, a tree guards? Do I need to stake in, in, or guy it? Um, tree wraps um, are somewhat subjective in the research world. Uh, if you're going to use them, again, one of the things that they do is, is protect from mechanical damage. If you've got uh, a lot of activity or mowing or, or um, you know, um, it, bikes, uh, things like that that could damage the tree while it's still young and that uh, bark is tender, uh, just make sure it's flexible um, it, because that helps expand with the tree because a lot of times people don't go back and take them off. And the, if they're not expandable, then obviously we're going to get that girdling situation on the trunk. Um, it does protect some from the winter sun. Um, but again, there's some research uh, from a colleague of mine in, in uh, Washington State that says that this may not be the issue, may actually cause additional heating. So still waiting on that. So make sure you just inspect them, adjust them on a regular basis. They really only need to be on there during the establishment period and no longer um, because it can cause some issues with development of the trunk tissue if left on uh, too long. This doesn't get exposure to the sun, doesn't harden off, so to speak, and can, uh, can also harbor some uh, wood decaying insects. Um, so we can have some issues, especially under tree wraps. Um, it stays moist too long. Also, a lot of wood decaying organisms like to burrow down in there and it's kind of a moist, uh, dark environment. And so you can cause some problems there. Again, not necessarily a bad thing as long as you check them um, and don't leave them on too long. But um, the by far the uh, white flexible plastic um, is much preferred over the paper treated wraps. This is what can happen when you leave it on too long. Um, you get that uh, nice, perfect environment for boring insects and decay. Uh, tree supports, I won't get into too much detail about that because I could talk uh, um, a very long time on this. Uh, but it does add stability, especially in, where it's necessary. It does reduce theft and vandalism and also it keeps the mowers away. Uh, but if you stake it for too long, um, it can reduce the tree's ability to develop a good stable root system and trunk taper. 
um, which is important um, for establishing itself in its new location. Um, it's either done right or very wrong. In fact, it's really not um, recommended again, unless you have very specific environmental conditions that uh, exposure like from wind um, that can cause a tree to, to blow around in the hole. Um, but the rules of staking is don't stake too tightly, meaning or wrap it too tightly at the top, uh, not too high and not for too long. Again, it's kind of like the trunk wraps. Um, only for a year is about all you really need until that tree really gets established. Uh, this is what I was talking about as far as uh, um, exposure. Um, this was at a, a retail location. And you can see that where the wind is just constantly whipping this uh, little maple. And as a result, it's just kind of wallowing around in that hole. Now, this was a, a, a fall planting of spruce trees and uh, spruce are, you know, they don't lose their leaves. So they're like a sail and they catch a lot of wind. So these guys just blew right over in that uh, basically cornfield turn retail shopping. So again, specific locations certainly can use uh, the help and assistance from those tree support systems. And this is what happens when you don't take them off. Um, obviously, it can cause issues. Trees will grow around them sometimes without any problem, or it may girdle them uh, to the point where actually the tree is just cut in half with the right wind loading, and then it just breaks off. Um, also, remove the stakes. That's not good either. That's uh, also very unsafe in a neighborhood if a kid wants to climb a tree or, or gets too close to it or runs into it. So. Um, again, safety issues uh, for the neighborhood, but also not good for the tree. Um, there is a, a extension publication on this on a, a lot of information on how to stake and um, and some of the details that go into that process. Um, it's available on the education store as well. So kind of ending up here with the with the major parts of the um, early aftercare is watering most plants like about an inch of water per week. Um, I like to use the five plus five rule, which is five gallons plus five gallons for every inch in diameter. So if you've got a 15 inch tree, or excuse me, three inch tree, you put in about 15 gallons of water. But again, be careful not to overwater. Uh, drainage is the key here. So you want to make sure that uh, you, you water based on consumption by the tree and, and weather conditions. Not that it's oh, it's Saturday. Um, I always water my tree on Saturday. Well, again, it may you may be causing big more problems. Too much water can be just as uh, of a disadvantage as, as too little. So get in there and check the soil. A lot of people are using those bags. This causes a perfect environment for those decay organisms. Um, because you got cool moisture moisture in those bags is causing condensation in a dark environment. So use them, but when they're not in use, take them off. Also check them to make sure that uh, um, they're not getting into, into uh, issues that uh, can cause problems for the tree later on. Often asked about pruning. Really very little pruning should be done. Um, I'll talk a lot more about this uh, next Thursday evening, um, especially for young trees. Uh, but the thing is do is just remove anything that's dead or dying or damaged, what I call non-beneficial plant parts. Uh, perhaps some branches were broken during the planting or transport process. Uh, but we want to establish a good central leader and good spacing for our on the trunk. Um, so, so we'll talk more about that next week. But um, we don't want to be excessive when it comes to the pruning, just, to, just pruning to maintain those objectives as you see there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, fertilization may sound like a good idea, but it's certainly not a planting. I recommend, again, unless special circumstances require some special um, conditions, but uh, for the most part, uh, most of our container plants and bald and burlap plants have been in the nursery and maintained very well. Remember, they're selling canopy, they're selling the green part. And so they fertilize extensively in order to make that a more aesthetic looking tree for purchase. So the best thing to do is to wait about a year or two and it probably will need it then. Um, so make sure you wait um, and always check the pH and, and do a soil test if you're not certain. Um, but uh, remember those fertilizer salts and new roots uh, can cause some problems. And also the tree's trying to spend a lot of resources in establishing a new root system. But it also takes a lot of energy to digest that additional or supplemental 
nutrition that you're providing for it. So it's important that you uh, perhaps wait a little bit before you get into the fertilization of that tree. So if you want some additional information about what's going on in our landscapes and with your trees as far as pests, make sure you subscribe to the Purdue Landscape Report. Um, this is, or find us on Facebook. We have uh, bi-weekly newsletters and also have uh, like current emerging issues like spotted, spotted lantern flies become an issue. Gypsy moth was an issue not too long ago. Uh, of course, um, there's a team of uh, professionals and, um, and uh, professors that work on the landscape report and, and provide some really good information there. So I'm going to uh, turn this over to Ashley um, with a couple of announcements and also see if we need to moderate any questions. Good evening, meeting participants. Thank you for your questions. I'm gonna read them to Lindsay and let him address them. But before I do that, um, if you are attending this seminar for CEUs for um, your Arborist certification, if you would please uh, put your name and certification number in a comment to make sure that you get credit for being here tonight, we'll make sure that gets sent into ISA. All right, Lindsay, your first question is, what are your thoughts on biochar during backfilling? Um, well, that's a good question. Biochar was one of those biostimulants that uh, we've been uh, testing at Purdue and also um, with Tree Lafayette. We found some very good results with that. That's sort of, um, it's not really uh, an amendment. It's a much more innocuous um, uh, additive to the soil that really uh, helps with the greening and kind of neutralizes some of the issues that might be in the soil um, from poisoning, fragmentation, and so forth. So that would be one that I would recommend uh, to use, especially in urban and poor soil environments, uh, because uh, you can't really hurt it. It's a natural uh, uh, material. And it's basically just uh, um, activated charcoal. And so we found some good results. I've, in fact, I've used it at, at my home um, on some trees and, and control trees, and they are performing better with it. So in poor conditions, that's a good, good choice. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Your second question is, would you be able to talk a little about hillside planting? Mm -hmm. uh, hillside plantings uh, do produce uh, some issues. Um, especially if you have an exposed part of the root system. Oftentimes there is a necessity for some shoring up, um, usually with um, some stones or some type of boulders or something in order to add or augment the planting area. You, you can't really plant it on a slope, obviously, because the tree is going to be crooked. So you may have to adapt the root ball or the um, surrounding soil environment or add some type of retaining system at the bottom in order to get the proper depth for that planting system. Okay. Next for, the next, for the next question, um, this is the, um, the, what the Purdue Education Store looks like. For those of you who like to use scanners, um, this QR code here can be scanned. It'll take you right to the Purdue Education Store for urban tree care um, that you see here. So I'll leave that up here while Ashley is reading the questions. Smaller matted roots in outer edges of containers. Can we just separate by hand without reducing the root length? My question applies to smaller container trees that do not have thick root systems. No, that's a good question. As I mentioned, not every tree needs that uh, container um, slicing or boxing. If, if it's a young tree, you know, I'm talking like, you know, an inch or under, it's probably going to be fine, especially shrubs. If you don't see that, that circling mat of roots, then you're probably better off just, as you mentioned, teasing it or making sure there's no dysfunctional roots present and it should be fine. So not all of them need boxed or shaved. That's a good question and good to point out. Not everyone, need, not ev every tree is its own and very specific. And so each one needs, needs to be treated according to its situation. So yeah, if it doesn't exhibit those symptoms, then don't, don't, don't do the treatment. Okay. All right, next, is it okay to cover the root flare with mulch? Um, yeah, I, you know, I've planted literally thousands of trees in my life and we often get a little bit um, overboard 
when it comes to, oh my gosh, don't let the mulch touch the root flare or the trunk. Look, it's not going to hurt it. Think about a tree in the woods. There's inches of leaf litter and organic matter on those seedlings, and they're doing just fine. Now, what you don't want to do is exceed that two inch margin there. You know, if you want a more of a uh, even surface on your on your mulch ring, it's okay if it touches really. Um, it's just don't mount it up against there where you can't get air movement and you get excessive moisture, which can cause some decay or it, it's deep enough that'll harbor some of those uh, pesky little um, hairy rats that um, like to burrow in the mulch areas and will actually feed on that cambium layer in the winter time and girdle the tree. So just don't be excessive and uh, it'll be fine if it, that mulch touches the root flare of the trunk. Okay. Next, while I understand that mulch Everest isn't a good idea, isn't it recommended to plant a little higher in clay soil? A little. Uh, yeah, well, a li little is a relevant term. Um, it's, if you're going to err on any side of planting, it should be on the high side. Now, th the best thing to do is if you do have a clay compacted soil, is rather than go higher, um, I suggest that you <clears throat> check in the bulletin um, that or the publication. It talks about creating shallow wide configurations where you don't plant it, um, um, or dig a bigger hole, but basically what you're doing for that compacted clay soil, plant it at the proper depth, but till about uh, around that uh, soil ball, that planting pit, about six inches deep, about two feet out. And what that does is create, um, it alleviates the compaction, allows those roots to extend into that new environment much easier. Um, if you're planted too shallow, what will happen is the, it's gonna think that the mulch is its growing medium and you're gonna get a lot of your very important roots growing in that mulch and it's gonna be very susceptible to temperature extremes. So um, it's best to go to that shallow wide configuration rather than um, trying to raise the ball. Okay. Uh, next question, would any of the information shared differ for an evergreen? No, no, there would be the same planting protocols. That's a very good question. Uh, oftentimes don't talk about evergreens uh, enough. Um, evergreens, most of them come in containers. Um, some of your larger specimens may be bald and burlap. Uh, but if they're containerized, then they've probably been growing in there for uh, three to five years. So the girdling may not be as extensive. Um, if they're bald and burlap, um, they're probably a very small root system, but root systems are a little more compact on many of our evergreens. Um, and also uh, another interesting fact is a lot of our um, gymnosperms or evergreen species don't have a root flare. They just basically go straight down. So when you're looking to see if it's too deep, look for that main order root level. Whenever you start feeling the top roots, then, then you've found the grade. Um, so I've run into that several times with planting, um, especially uh, Norway spruce, which is really about the only evergreen I, that we recommend um, for planting in Indiana because of our harsh conditions and soils. Um, but uh, yeah, that, but otherwise the planting protocols are the same. Thank you for that question. All right. What about rooting stimulators? Some nurseries sell them or give them away with purchase. Yeah, um, it's kind of one of those uh, goodwill type of things. In fact, I've had some uh, people give me a call at the uh, Purdue Extension office that said that to, if they did not use it, it would void their warranty, which is uh, to me a bit unethical and not staying current. But those stimulants do not work. They do, in fact, they, they probably don't do anything. It's kind of like, you know, if, if you can't help, at least do no harm. Well, that's probably what, they're, what, what it is. There's nothing there that's actually going to help the plant, but it probably won't hurt it. But if you don't have to use it, um, then I highly recommend not, unless it's, again, special, harsh urban situations. Okay. Oh. 
Okay, uh, next question. How, roughly how long does it take a one and a half inch caliper tree to catch up and overtake a two and a half inch caliper tree? <laughs> oh, we're getting into the weeds here. Uh, well, actually, there's been a lot of research on that and I gosh, the la the la if I remember correctly, um, the, a, a three inch tree will grow um, roughly 40 times faster than a six inch spaded tree. So actually the smaller trees are more vigorously growing, have more roots and will actually um, establish themselves much quicker. I've seen uh, three inch plants catch up with five and six inch transplanted plants within two to three years. Um, because the root system has been so extensively damaged or left behind during the harvest process on the larger trees that it takes them much longer to regenerate that root system. So oftentimes I'll tell people to buy the smaller tree, even one and a half inch caliper will actually grow faster than a three inch caliper. And within two to three years, you won't know the difference. And I'm not sure it's worth the return on the investment. So I've had that conversation before and there is research that supports that. Okay, Lindsay, this is maybe just a, another comment on an earlier question. It says my question about planting higher in clay was assuming a raised bed type effect with soil, not just mulch. Sorry to not be clear on that. Oh, if it's a raised bed, yeah, that's fine. Um, as long as there's enough soil to support it. I've seen where you've got hard pan or, or you know, really compacted soil. And what will happen is they will bring, um, it's, they'll basically just dig a little bowl, set the tree in it, and then just throw wheelbarrows of dirt around it. Well, that's not going to be enough to protect that tree in a couple ways. One, from temperature extremes, and two, there's not going to be enough soil volume there to maintain an ample supply of water. So you've got to get it in the ground at least halfway or more in order for it to really establish itself in the larger uh, soil environment. Um, the, you know, with raised planters, I could talk extensively just on planter trees and planting systems and tree vaults, especially with our urban foresters. Um, much different protocols and considerations there, but you want to get it in the ground as much, as far as you can before you start adding soil. So thanks for that clarification. I think we got time for one more, Ashley. This is the last one, so that's uh, perfect. Uh, in my home area, Valparaiso Chesterton, there seems to be a lot of spruces failing and uprooting root systems seem to be limited soil conditions question mark yeah that, um, roots are very opportunistic meaning that they'll only grow where it's easiest for them to grow and oftentimes in those urban suburban um, soils they're very compacted and most a lot of our evergreens have a more of a shallow root system um, I've seen roots um, only about six inches and, and in fact some of a, the like um, spruce may only go three or four inches. So that's not uncommon, especially on hard, on, um, hard compacted clay soil. Um, so again, that's one of those situations where you got to really make sure that you uh, treat, uh, do the soil treatments and try to alleviate that compaction so they can establish a deeper root system as quickly as possible. Otherwise, they may need some long-term support systems in order to uh, allow them to establish. Okay, I think that was the last question then, Lindsay. All right, thank you, Ashley. Thanks everybody for joining us. Don't forget, uh, next Thursday, we have, uh, we're gonna continue our talk for trees. Um, I'm gonna focus on tree pruning primarily, especially the younger trees. You know, we've, we've chosen our tree, we've planted it. Now, what do we do with it as far as maintaining it after establishment? And also talk about some more, uh, some other maintenance issues and do some Q and A. So again, thanks Ashley and thanks uh, to the IAA and uh, Purdue Extension for putting on this webinar. It is being recorded um, and it will be posted on the um, Purdue Forestry Extension Facebook page. Um, so if you're looking for that um, or want to share it with a friend, um, it'll be available in about three to four days. So thank you and we'll look forward uh, to seeing you uh, or at least uh, talking to you next week.